appreciable. You know, they had huge surplus in every every respect. Foreign exchange reserves or balance of payments and all that. Towards, I should say, towards the late 90s, early 2000, 2002, 2003, you see in the world map an economic giant rising up in the shape of the People's Republic of China. Not, no one had, uh, you know, anticipated any point of time. The nation like China will come up that very fast. But in all about, planned for about 10 years from 82, 82, 90, 92, 93, and then worked from 92 to 2000 very hard. And from 2000 and on onwards, that was there for the whole world to see what it was like. Steadily growing at 12%, 13%, 14%. Industry growing at 17, 18%. Agriculture growing at 14, 15%. Service sector also growing at 18, 20%. Infrastructure 20, 22%. Foreign exchange reserve going up. What used to be when we had 0.5 billion dollars, they had 0.3 billion dollars. And then we were going up from 0.5 to 0.75 to 1 to 1.5 to 2 to 2.5 to 3, 3.5, 6, 7, 8, and all that. Slowly they were from 0 0.3 to 1, 2, 3, then 5, 10, 20, then 30, 40, 50, 50, 60, 70, 80 billion dollars of direct foreign investments. It's studying 90 billion dollars now. And then started building their economy like anything, investments flowing, flowing like anything into the mainland China and infrastructure, huge projects, seaports, airports, everything of international standard, quality house hotels, five stars, seven stars, you name them. Several, 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 several urban cities completely being rebuilt, huge industrial undertaking being established with foreign investment, foreign collaborations and all that. In about what we see, in about, about 15 years after the hectic reconstruction work today, they are almost on top of the world. Almost on top of the world. No country has two trillion dollars of foreign exchange reserves. No country. Nowhere. Nobody has even half of that. That is China. The next one is Japan with 957 trillion billion dollars. They are two trillion dollars. Two thousand billion dollars plus. And then we have Abu Dhabi with 800 billion dollars. We have got uh, South Korea with 500 and odd billion dollars. We have Taiwan with 300 and odd. We have uh, Australia with less than 300 billion dollars. We have uh, Soviet Union close to 190 billion dollars. We have Brazil with 235 billion dollars. And we, India, now built up over the last four or five years steadily, systematically. We are close to 285 billion dollars of foreign exchange reserves from what it was, less than $1 billion or less than one week's requirement. That is where we are. And we have also established a you know, substantial amount of growth, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 percent growth in the last three, four years in terms of uh, exports on, uh, on real terms, infrastructure growth, economy growth, due in 2003, 4 at 8.59. We also grew suddenly, what was what used to be 2 percent, 3 percent and all, we picked up very steadily we picked up and we are now only among the two or three nations in the world where the economic growth has been over 6%. There are not many nations, all of European nations have been below 3%. USA is struggling with 1 to 2% and on top of that you had this subprime crisis in the United States, you all heard about as management students, you need to know that. Completely, you know, because of absence of moral values, ethical values, business ethics, standards, you see. What was a giant of an economic nation, they completely destroyed their roots. They destroyed their foundation, everything. That nation would have gone down the drain, would have gone disappeared. In the same manner as the uh, Soviet Union disappeared. What, what did happen to the Soviet Union? Because of all, they got everything wrong. We did not know how to introduce liberalization, globalization, nothing. So what, you know, the Soviet economy used to be the second largest in the world at one point in time. They became almost 131st or so in the world. And what used to be three rubles a dollar in the 80s, three rubles a dollar in the 80s and steadily at that, and they came down to 11,500 rubles a dollar. The same economic situation perhaps would have been fallen on the United States also had not Bush come up with two major uh, economic stimulus packages of over $950, $1840 billion. Next, 
and then Obama came and he also had an $830 billion. These are the biggest they announced. And without announcing how many billion dollars they have given through the back door, one is not too sure about that. Just pumping money, pumping money into business houses and uh, insurance uh, banks, uh, commercial institutions and all that, and trying to make them survive. That exercise has not succeeded as it out of the 20 top banking institutions, insurance institutions, pension fund institutions, 18 have already disappeared. And we have only two of them surviving, J.P. Morgan and, uh, what is that, J.P. Morgan and one more city, city not city, yeah, no city bank, no city bank, Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs and uh, J.P. Morgan, they two are the largest surviving and uh, you know, the, the, the economic stimulus has started slowly working but ethical values, standards, business ethics have not changed. Therefore, we are not too sure whether they will, unless, as was referred to by Professor Bain, not, it's a matter of human relations. They should know these people, management by people. Unless the people have basic qualities now, unless you have leaders, business leaders, management leaders, they can't bring up their economy. So, we are, the whole world is now looking at their, unless their moral fabric enhances, increases, you basically cannot get out of what the rut they have thrown into. So, with themselves, so we are not too sure whether two years of exercise have seen the U.S. economy through, but unless we all want the U.S. economy to survive, that is when we are talking about our economy, our budget, unless the U.S. economy survives, the whole of Europe cannot survive, and the other supporting nations like Japan and Australia and Canada cannot survive, the whole of Middle East cannot survive, who is consuming all the products of, including oil, you see of the Middle East, it is all Europe, advanced nations, China and all that, even China cannot survive long enough without U.S. support. India cannot survive because we may say, no, no, we are all insulated and all that, but U.S. completely fails and Europe uh, fails and all that. Where is the market and you know, where is the technology? So all of us want U.S. to survive, so everyone is standing behind the U.S. and see U.S. economy. It is in that background, you see, in the last two, three years, we are going through a very difficult time. But fortunately, nothing happened in this country, largely because we, we couldn't say that it is all because of the efficiency of the regulatory mechanism. We say that, of course, we have. We do have a very efficient uh, regulatory system in RBI, in SEBI, in Insurance Regulatory Authority, in Control Order General of India, in uh, Ministry of Company Affairs. These are all supervising bodies and they do a good job. But more than that, more than that, the, the credit goes into the fact that the public sector undertaking, especially the large center, central public sector undertakings, have all been completely rewound. You look at most of them, the credit should go largely to one man called T.K. Nair, who is the Prime Minister Secretary, who was in charge of recruitment of the heads of the public sector undertakings in the last five years. And he has, been, he has been singularly responsible for ensuring that practically every PSU in the country in the last seven, eight years or so, when he was first with the committee and he became chairman, had the right kind of persons to head that. And the chief executive of a PSU made all the difference, you see, in ensuring that these PSUs worked very well. They revamped and refurbished. So PSUs got stabilized and of course government also were monitoring. You know, there is an MOU system which PSUs have to sign with the government that they will do this, do, do that, and a very good, uh, you know, monitoring system, corporate governance have all been established. The private sector in India too got, uh, also got reorganized, you know, restructured themselves, and so most of the houses, they restructured, the Tatas, the Birlas, the Ambani's came up, and you now see the top 100 private sector houses are also well set. So generally, you find that the industry, the manufacturing sector are all get, getting organized. And infrastructure also receiving the kind of uh, you know, attention because of the information technology revolution. We became almost uh, number one in the world today it's in terms of uh, mobile connectivity, perhaps only next to China. In terms of information technology and software exports, we are on top. In outsourcing, we are on top. So even technology oriented knowledge management, India came up. So those sectors, the service sectors came up and service sectors contributing almost 60 percent of the national uh, revenue or GDP. So that, that ensured that that segment came up very well. And then, as I said, foreign direct investments started coming in substantially. NRI investments are now flowing at the rate of 18 to 20 billion dollars annually. 
direct foreign investments April to December 2009 has already crossed the 30 billion dollars and we may perhaps end up this year with about 43-44 billion dollars. The foreign institutional investments in our stock market has also been in the range of 15 to 20 billion dollars. We look at for external commercial borrowings by Indian corporates, they are allowed to borrow from foreign markets, raise money anywhere, anywhere in the world as NTPC has done or many will be doing and uh, that will also be another 15-20 million dollars. So you see FDI, FII, NRI, EZBs all put together close to 100 billion dollars coming into India annually. That is something very, very substantial. That is very substantial. Of course, that, that also requires that we need to manage those funds and economy, but that is what the Indian economy is about. All these, uh, you know, vibrance you see now is all because of all these factors. Now, in this background, you see, what are we going to do, what the budget has done and what we need to look at is very important. The budget cannot be looked at as a single document, it is part of the five-year plan also. In fact, it is very much part of the five-year plan. The planning commission lays down you know, several criteria in the, for the process of uh, the union you know, budgetary mechanism. And the five-year plans are also very, very important. But it is not as if the union budget is a national budget, it is so very important. It is not that very important today because today some of us believe that the state budgets are much more important than the national budgets. This is a, this is a real fact now. The state budgets, we look at more of the state budgets and important state budgets than the national budget for national economic revival. Why is it so? Because agriculture is a state subject. Substantially development of agriculture depends on what the state government does. Infrastructure substantially barring railways and national highways are a state subject. Even some part of port activity and port development are state subject. Healthcare is post state subject. Education is a state subject. So where, as was referred to the common man is concerned, a whole lot of uh, you know uh, activities, public distribution system is in the hands of the state government. So if state governments run well, the government of India will run well. The government of India has to give logistic support. The union budget must give the right kind of support, the right kind of trust, the right kind of policy for the state government and the nation to move forward. That is the importance of the union budget. And also, it is important because under the finance panel, under the 13th finance panel, have now laid down that the sharing of revenue it is not as if the entire revenue will go to the central government. Government's revenue come out of where the budget consists of revenue and expenditure, isn't it? Government raises funds out of tax revenues and non-tax revenues. Tax revenues this year are the order of 7.8 lakhs crores. 7.8 lakhs crores is the total tax revenue. And total non-tax revenue is close to another 4 crores, close to 4 crores. And the aggregate expenditure of the government of India, aggregate expenditure is 11.17 lakhs crores. This is the nation's budget. You understand? Tax revenue about 7 crores, non-tax revenue about 4 crores and aggregate expenditure is about 11 crores. And then there are plan and non-plan expenditure. There are so many other commitments, interest repayment and so